So it's just after seven o'clock now, so we will make a start. Martina Minas Nerpel is a professor of Egyptology at Trier University in Germany and the director of the Center of Ancient Studies at Trier University. Until 2018, she was a professor of Egyptology at Swansea University. Martina's research interests concentrate on the one hand on the religious and cultural history of Egypt, with a focus on the, relig uh, the royal ideology and ruler cults of the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. On the other hand, she is also a specialist in the hieroglyphic uh, temple texts of the Greco-Roman period and Demotic, which she'll be talking about tonight. She has also worked on multilingual texts, including Greek and Latin, such as the trilingual Victory Stila of Cornelius Gallus. Martina co-directs the Belgium-German Epigraphic Mission to Karnak, Egypt, and serves as the principal investigator of an international team researching the Egyptian temple of Isis at Shen Hur, just to the north of Luxor, which was built and decorated during the first uh, two centuries AD. Martina wasn't initially scheduled to speak at the conference if we were having it in Swansea, so we're very happy that she has been able to uh, present tonight since the conference has now been moved uh, to a virtual format of, uh, of Zoom. And I'm very happy to have Martina here because we have known each other for what, 13, 14 years now when she first arrived at Swansea. So I've, I've been privileged to have been one of her students. Uh, Martina was my, my mentor, my supervisor, as well as being a colleague uh, at Swansea for a while. And I'm very proud to call her my friend. So over to you, Martina. Thank you very much. And hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening, even if it's only remotely. I want to thank Ken for inviting me to participate in the Swansea Annual Conference of 2020 in this virtual room. Despite the rather dry title of Accounting Grain, I hope I can interest you in a small but fascinating object which is now housed in the Egypt Centre of Swansea University. As you will see, it is pretty much unique. Some of you might know that I have lived and worked in beautiful Wales for 12 years, from 2006 to 2018. It must be roughly eight years ago that Caroline Graves Brown asked me whether I would like to have a look at one of their mummy labels. I happily agreed, expecting something very different to what it turned out to be. Let's just try, no, here it is. The wooden tablet, which you see here, is 13.5 centimeters long and 5 centimeters wide, forming a rectangle with a trapezoidal handle projecting from one of the short sides. A hole is drilled through the handle so that it could have been attached to an object. This tablet has indeed the form of a mummy label, but it was not used as such. What are mummy labels? Mummy labels were used in ancient Egypt as a means of identifying corpses when they were transported to the necropolis. Mostly made of wood, more rarely of stone, faience, or something, sometimes even ivory, they were attached to the mummy with a piece of string or cord through a hole drilled in the tack. The majority dates to the Greco-Roman period although there are some New Kingdom forerunners. Mummy labels are inscribed in Demotic, Greek, sometimes in both languages, or less commonly in hieratic or hieroglyphs. Thousands of these labels have been snatched from a mummy's necks and are stored in the museums worldwide. I show you as an, well, I try. Let's Okay, here we are. I show you an example, the label of Pecusis from around AD 200, now housed in the Egyptian Museum Berlin. Pecusis came from Bompe in the Panapolitis, which is the ninth Egyptian, Upper Egyptian known. Panopolis, or modern Achmim, was its capital. On one side, it is described, inscribed in Greek, on the other, in Demotic giving personal information about the deceased. If you are interested in mummy labels, you can go to two obvious places. 
The first one is the massive study by Sven Fleming, published in 2011, two volumes. Or you could visit the Mummy Labor database of the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. I give you the link here. And I think uh, Ken will post it as well. I show you another example in Berlin, again originally from Epanapolitis. This mummy label dates to the second century AD and was once written for Tamezit or Tamezio in a grassicized form, daughter of Pamin. Her mother was Tawebat or Tueba. The label expresses the wish that her soul may live before Osiris Soka, the great god the Lord of Abydus. In case you are not familiar with the various scripts and languages of ancient Egypt, Demotic is the late phase of the ancient Egyptian language attested from the 7th century BC to the 5th century AD. It was mainly used in the Ptolemaic period and the 1st century AD. Demotic not only denotes a phase of the ancient Egyptian language, but also a script. Demotic is a highly cursive form of hieroglyphs, mainly used for administrative records, letters, legal documents, etc. Later also for religious texts. The famous Rosetta Stone in the British Museum, which attests a decree of a priestly synod, issued in 196 BC, is inscribed in the three languages or scripts used in Egypt in the Ptolemaic period. Hieroglyphic Egyptian at the top, Demotic in the middle, and Greek in the lower bit. The inscriptions of mummy labels usually consist of a short text giving important information, such as the name, the parentage, age, place of residence, destination of the deceased, and in some cases, further indications about, for example, the shipping, landing of the corpses, or something else. The inscriptions on the mummy labels were meant to identify the deceased and to record a person's name for eternity. I show you two other examples which have less or no text in comparison to the mummy labels already shown, but they have iconographic details. They both date again to the second century AD and are housed in the Landesmuseum Mainz in Germany. The first mummy label comes from Hawara, nearer in the Fayum. It is 15.9 centimeters high and 8.7 centimeters wide. On the rector or front, a woman is depicted giving birth. On a verso, perhaps a physician. The second one comes probably from Thebes and is only 8.7 centimeters high and 6.8 centimeters wide. On a recto, we read the Greek Tsenzaos, she lived for 46 years. On a verso, the god Anubis is depicted. Mummy labels could also include a short formula for the welfare of the deceased in the hereafter, which testifies to their religious function. The small objects even sometimes play the role of a cheap substitute for funerary stele, as occasionally indicated by their shape and the fact that they could be identified as wheat, Egyptian stele, or stele in Greek. With this background knowledge, let us now turn to the Swansea object. The tablet is almost complete, with smaller damage at the upper left corner of the rectangle. The tablet's recto is inscribed with 12 lines of demotic, starting immediately below the handle. The script in black ink is clearly legible in the first eight lines but more faded in the following lines, thus causing some problems when deciphering it. The verso is inscribed with one remaining line of demotic. Traces of ink 
seem to be discernible at the beginning of a possible second line. The rest of the verso was not inscribed. Let us start with the fine circumstances, which are rather obscure. It is unclear where the small wooden tablet, now part of the welcome collection in the Egypt Center, originally came from. The text itself, although providing specific numbers, as you will see, does not give any specific indication for the provenance. Sir Henry Welcome, from Almond, Wisconsin, USA, trained as a pharmacist and came to London in 1880, where he set up a successful pharmaceutical firm. Welcome became a collector, traveled to Egypt, among other countries, and employed agents to buy objects for him in many of these countries. After his death, the Wellcome Trust was established for his vast collection. In 1971, an agreement was signed by University College London on behalf of the Wellcome Trustees and University College Swansea, as Swansea University was called then. The objects are now housed in the Egypt Centre of Swansea. According to the curator of the Egypt Centre, Dr. Carolyn Graves-Brown, the object may have been either bought from Franklin Hood, from whom Sir Welcome obtained various objects, referred to in the catalogue by Sotheby, Wilkinson and Hodge from November 1924, lot 147. Quote, four wooden mummy labels in Greek, one with a long hieratic inscription. For the untrained eye, the hieratic script may be mixed with demotic. The tablet may also have been bought, and this seems more likely, from the McGregor collection. In the 1922 catalogue of the McGregor collection of antiquities, Sotheby, Wilkinson and Hodge, lot 642, uh, two, refer to four mummy labels in wood, two inscribed in demotic and two in Greek. Henry Stowe, one of Welcome's, uh, Welcome's men, bought these objects. From the form of the text, it became rather clear that it is a list or account, not something which one would find on a mummy label. And indeed, it has nothing to do with a deceased or a deceased. It belongs to the world of the living. It is inscribed in the motic with a grain account. The label had no religious function at all, but an administrative one, for which we can glimpse the everyday life of ancient Egypt. We should thus not call it a mummy label, but a wooden tablet or wooden label. I show you the drawing which I produced. I did it with a digital pen on the computer using a high resolution photograph in Photoshop. It is a long, sometimes painful process of many, many days because one must decipher while drawing. And you can see the ink is pretty much faded at the lower bottom. In the first line, there is directly a code word that determines the entire context. Ta peret sechet, seed grain. It's pretty easy to read. I hope you can see the mouse, but at the beginning of the red circle, you see uh, the article ta, and then very clearly the word peret, and then sechet. In the following line, or lines, there is Sorry, in the following lines, there are other important words, and I only point out three of those. Pa telu, that is in the second line. Su, which we can see quite often, and I have circled the nicest one in line four. And shebena, which we can see in line six and later on as well. Now let's have a quick look what these words mean. Patelu is the term for arable land. So we know that the seed grain should go to arable land. Su, which you can be circled in the fourth line, means wheat, 
which is repeated in a demotic left row several times. In a, translate, a transliteration, it is the right row. Um, I should say that the motic is always written right to left. A clear example is written in line four, as I said before, and you can see three little signs, a little dot at the beginning or a tick, um, and then the middle one is very clearly written, and at the end, you see a plant determinative, of course, in a very cursive way. You can see the same word in the line below. Of course, it is not as well preserved and in other lines. The third word, shebena, which is beautifully written uh, in demotic, again with a plant determinative at the end, is so far completely unknown in demotic. I was quite excited when I uh, saw it. The writing is extremely clear, so the deciphering is not the problem here. It is the meaning. Both the uh, demotic, demotic glossar and the online Chicago demotic dictionary, these are the two important tools we use when we translate, do not refer to this word shebena, which seems to be related to the um, older word sheben, grain especially since it is also written with a plant determinative, as I pointed out already. The word sheben, grain, seems similar to the later attastic shbin, Coptic, or shbon, which can be translated as grain as well. There exists also the Coptic word shbenne, which seems to uh, uh, mean palm fiber, and it's related to the Greek zebenion, which means palm fiber. The Coptic word palm fiber does not really fit our context here, so I went with the word grain in very general terms. Also because according to Clarissa and van der Beeken and Salzig, who looked into personal names, a final olive can be added to names terminating in N. This seems to be the case for our new word Shebenna, which might, de uh, develop, uh, might have developed from Sheben. So it might well mean grain, it could have a more specific meaning, but it eludes us as long as we don't have other attestations. But let's have a look at the text and I'm going to read it to you. The account of seed grain that has gone to the arable land, this is Patello, in month three of Achet, day six, and we have a quarter of an artabi of wheat. They didn't write artabi because it was very obvious, because wheat is measured in, uh, artab in an artabi, the plural is artabi in Greek. In day eight, we have one of these artabi of wheat. Day nine, it's half of an artabi of wheat. And in line six, um, it um, breaks the column because he then says again one third. And then the new word comes, grain, um, shbena. And of that, we have a half and a twelfth. And you see the fractions are really difficult of wheat. Day 10, more of the wheat, day 17, they only wrote day seven. It's pretty clear, but it is uh, obviously an enumeration. So I think it must be day 17. It's 112 of an artab of wheat, day 19, wheat, grain. So they have both words. Day 20, wheat, grain, half an artab, day 23. It's not very clear. Uh, so it's a lot of guesswork. Um, in line 11, wheat and grain, and then it seems to say um, another measure, but we don't know what it is, or perhaps it was blank. And then we have a total, and uh, it, it actually adds up to uh, four artabi, a half of, one of the artabi, and 12. The fractions on the tablet were the biggest challenge uh, to solve, I have to say. It's really complicated. Demotic fractions are complicated in the best preserved circumstances, but here they are partly destroyed. 
So um, it was a challenge and I'm very grateful to my colleagues uh, Sven Fleming, um, Friedhelm Hoffmann and Joachim Quack with whom I had uh, um, uh, the um, opportunity to discuss these texts when I uh, deciphered them. The verso seems pretty simple. It starts, um, I think, with the word for total. Um, and then again, it says something about wheat and day 19, but that is all I can read. Um, the text on the verse does not seem to continue the inscription from the recto. The it might have been a new account. The beginning of the line is completely lost, um, so, and there might be different options to read, um, but it's not going to help us for the bigger meaning. Now, what is the analysis uh, of this object? The text appears to deal with the distribution of seed grain, measured in fractions of the artabe. The word for grain measure, artabe, which contained roughly 30 to 40 liters, oh, sorry, 30 to 40 liters, depending on the specific artabe used, is not mentioned but implied. The amount totals more than four artabi of grain. If the numbers in line 12 um, are read correctly to four and a half and a twelfth of an artabi, these are very common numbers for Egyptian accounts. On the basis of the information gained from documentary papari of a Ptolemaic period, Schneebel calculated roughly one artabi of wheat as seed grain per arura of royal and private land. This is an ancient measurement for land. Through, uh, though the varying numbers are tested, probably depending on the quality of land. Arura is Greek and means the same as patelu, arable land. In ancient Egypt, it was a square of 100 Egyptian cubits each way, which is 2,700 square meters, or two thirds of an acre. The amount of land which could be sown with the amount of artabi detailed in the Swansea grain account adds up to more than four arurai, so quite a large part of land. As for the seed grain, two subcategories are mentioned, su, wheat, and shebena grain, in more generic terms, I think. But if you have suggestions, I'm very, very happy to hear those. According to Murray, in his contribution, Cereal Production and Processing, published in 2000, a mixture of two or more cereal or pulp species are sometimes sown together. As already mentioned, the term Shibena is not attested in any other, at least published text so far. And I've spoken to a lot of specialists, nobody uh, knows this term. So that, is, uh, so that is difficult to determine the exact meaning. The writing for Su changes in line eight. In the first seven lines, the scribe wrote a very beautiful plant sign as a determinative from line eight onwards, he omits the plant sign and adds a small tick, perhaps the abbreviated form of a plant sign. We don't know why the scribe did that, whether he was in a hurry or just uh, didn't want to write the plant sign again, we don't know this. Although rather well preserved, the sits im Leben of this wooden tablet is not entirely clear beyond the fact that seed grain is detailed. The delivery of grain starts on day six in the month of Hatur, the third month of Achet. A year is not given. The provenance from where exactly in Egypt the label originated remains unclear. The content of the inscription does not point to any specific area in Egypt. The word tool, Telu, only refers to arable land in general terms. This label could obviously have been attached to another object, which must have been associated with seed grain, men, the seed grain mentioned in line one. Wood was a material that could easily be reused by washing off this previous inscription. 
There is no indication, however, that the Swansea label was ever reused. I tried to find parallel uh, objects and I don't know many of uh, this kind of text. There is uh, this beautiful object, which I'll show you uh, uh, on this slide. It's uh, an example of a wooden tablet, which is now housed in the collection in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. It is quite big in comparison to the Swansea object. It's 52 centimeters high and 16.6 centimeters wide and up to two centimeters thick. And it came originally, that becomes clear from the inscription, from Gebelein. It is a portion of a well-worn piece of furniture, perhaps the lid of a box, not a tablet in the form of a mummy label. Both sides were reused as writing surfaces for six grain accounts, which all date to the 17th of October to the 15th of December 99 BC, published in 2008 by Desmarais and Brian Muse in a festschrift work. Wood was a very precious material in Egypt and constantly reused. Labor as they were used for mummies were practical as tags for goods of, as well and probably readily available. First use or second use are reused again and again. There exist some very short grain related texts, but not on wooden tablets in the form of mummy labels. Ursula Kaplony Heckel dealt with many accounts conveniently collected in her book Land und Leute am Nil nach dem Motischen Inschriften, Papyri und Erstracker, published 2009. But the few grain accounts she mentions are not on wooden tablets, but usually on Ostraka. The tablet in the Egypt Center is thus rather unique. I haven't found another one in the museum, so Swansea can be very proud of its little object. As for the date of the Swansea label, no year is given on the tablet, but we can study the handwriting that's commonly done in demotic. The paleography seems to attest some details that point to the late Ptolemaic or early Roman period. For example, the date of day 23 in line 11. In addition, a calamus, the Latin word for reed pen, seems to have been used instead of the traditional rush, which also points to the Roman period. Let's come to the summary. The rather unique object in the Egypt center in the form of a label is a short account, which relates to us the distribution of seed grain measured in fractions of an artabi resulting in a total of circa 130 to 180 liters. The seed grain was probably used for at least four arurai, roughly 11,000 square meters. A new subcategory of grain is mentioned, shebena, so far not attested in demotic texts or in any other text. The wooden tablet was probably once attached to a sack of seed grain that contained perhaps smaller sacks of grain so that the various grains were not mixed. But this is unclear. It is only clear that the wooden tablet could have been attached to something since it has a hole. Based on the paleography, we can date the tablet to the late Ptolemaic or the early Roman period and we can glimpse part of what was done in Egypt uh, to have grain. I have published my results in Encoria 35 in 2017. Encoria is an international journal dedicated to the studies of Demotic and Coptic texts only. If you are interested in an electronic off-print, you can download it from Dropbox. Ken is posting the link in the chat, I think. With this wooden tablet, the Egypt Center has a real treasure in its collection. It is small, made of wood and not of precious stone, and not very catching for the untrained eye, but it provides us an insight into everyday practices 
which are not very well known so far. Thank you.